about, and I feel like the Lord wants to share, how do you disciple at work? I'm going to step on some toes today, okay? So, because I know some of you have occupations that cause your character to come into question. No judgment here. Some of you feel very pressured to do things or say things or fudge things so that you will be a better employer. Are you with me? So, what does it mean to be a disciple at work? Now, if you don't have a job, you can apply this to school if you're in school. So, students, listen up. If you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, listen up. That's your job. That's your workplace. Amen? Is there anybody that can testify to that? Stay-at-home mom or dad? That's a workplace. Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes to the church to help strengthen their faith and encourage them. And he gets to this section in chapter 3 where he talks about the home. You can, you can read this in, in Colossians 3. I'm not going to go into this... Uh, section really quick should have bookmarked this but let me see all right um he talks about in verse 18 he talks about wives he talks about husbands he talks about children so he's, he's talking about how to be a christian in the home then he uses this word that may make you uncomfortable it's he says bond servants slaves now when you hear that there's a lot of emotion that goes with that because slavery in this sense, in the biblical sense, is very different than what you know and what I know as slavery. See, bond servants wanted to be bond servants. Does that make sense? In fact, you, you can open scriptures. Paul calls himself a bond servant of Christ. So he wants to be, so there is a, a good type of slavery, a biblical type of slavery, where we are slaves to Christ. He is our master and our teacher. But when he says this here, bond servants now, these weren't race-based. They weren't based on ethnicity. Um, in fact, bond servants were many times positions of authority. And you served with people that gave you positions of authority. People wanted to be Bond servants. In fact, it was the quickest way to become a Roman citizen. And so many people would volunteer to be bond servants, slaves. Now, why does, it, why does Paul write about it right here? Well, because most bond servants were found in the home. So you literally became part of the family. You, you, you were so close that they knew you in and out, and you knew them in and out. Okay? So, so check this out now. The reason this is important is because think about the people you work with or the people you go to school with. You are with them a lot. A lot. Sometimes more than your family. So it's going to be very important for us to learn how to be disciples at work, at school. In verse 22, listen to what Paul says. Bond servants... Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Here's the first thing. Obey your authority. Obey your authority. Now that word obey comes from two different words. Listen and under. I'm going to listen to my authority, to my boss, to my teacher. I'm going to, to listen. I'm going to be very attentive to, to what he says or she says and what they do. And what they expect. I'm going to know their needs before they even ask. And I'm going to come under their authority. What they say goes. Um, this reminds me of my honeymoon night. Don't, just, just bear with me. So we get married. We drive to Charleston. And we, we're hungry. We, we actually, right after our wedding, we, we drove to Burger King. Because we were so hungry. Like, we didn't eat a lot of food. I know we had food at the wedding. We were just, anyway. And, and so we got Burger King. But we get to Charleston, and we want to do a nice dinner. Like, this is my first time being married. I want to take her to someplace elegant. So, you know, I had some money that, that people gave me, not because I was rich. Or, I mean, it was nice. And so I found this restaurant with just a date. I don't even remember the date. Like, 1868. If Mandy's watching, she can 
she can uh, put in the chat and things like that. But it was this fancy restaurant, and I remember it so well. In fact, it was probably the most impressive restaurant I've ever been in. And you say, well, why? Was the food that good? Yeah. The food was great. I can't tell you what I ate, but I remember eating every, it was like a six-course meal, seven-course. It was great. Um, the ambiance, that's real important to me, by the way. Like, if I'm going to eat, I want, I want a nice ambiance, you know. Uh, I want it to look good, you know. I want a candlelight. Not too dark. I like to see what I'm eating. Um, you, you know what I mean? But the ambiance was really nice. I was dressed up. Mandy was dressed. Not, not like super dressed, but, you know. So anyway, this restaurant was amazing. But do you know why I loved it so much? Because when I walked in, I noticed along the wall. Two of the walls, of the four walls. I noticed that waiters and waitresses were all standing on the wall. And they weren't like today's waiters and waitresses. You know what I mean? Like, service, and if this is you, I apologize. But service is not great now. Like, they just congregate. Like, yesterday, a couple of nights ago, we went out to eat as a family. And all the waiters and waitresses were just talking to one another. And I got an empty glass. And, you, you know, I want to ding my fork on it and slurp in the straw or something. But, but like this restaurant, they're all standing and it's almost like attention. And they're looking at everything. So that's weird and different. So I, the hostess takes us to our table. And a, a waiter comes over and pulls out our chairs. Okay. And, and they, they said, you know, I'm going to scoot you up. Here's your napkin. They laid it across my lap. I'm like, well, okay. And, and so, and then the waiters are so attentive. Waiters are so attentive to me. Like, the glass of drink never got below a third. So, like, I would drink a third, and all of a sudden, here they come. And I drink a lot during a meal. And so, like, it, that's amazing to me. I didn't have to ask. They knew before I ever said anything to them. The coolest thing was they... We were done, after we were done a course, they would come by and they had this little comb. And they would brush the crumbs into this little container they had. I had never seen that. I've never seen it since. But, but what's my point in telling you this? This is what Paul is saying to us. That we are so attentive to our authority, to our boss, to our teacher, that we know their every move. We know what they want before they even ask for it. That's how we are to obey. That's what the word says. And I know the pushback. You don't know my boss. My boss is not a believer. My boss is a jerk. My t uh, students, I get it. It's the worst teacher in the world. You've got a class right now you're thinking of, and you're like, I hate that class. I hate that teacher. She's all out to get me. It seems, he's like, it, it, I get it. And we want the verse to read like I want the verse to read. This is the Chris Pratt version. Bond servants obey everything, those who are your earthly masters, but only if they're nice to you, if you agree with them, if they treat you fairly, and if you like them. If that happens, you got no problem. You, you got no problem. That's what you want when you work. You want a boss or you want a teacher or you want a, a mom or dad that's just like that. But Paul says, it doesn't matter if you agree with your boss. Obedience can come without agreement. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. Like some of us have some bosses that are just not logical. It's like, why are you doing this? We could just do this. Paul doesn't say give your opinion and, you know, overstep them. He says, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Why does he say earthly? Of course, he's, al he's alive. Your boss, your teacher, they're on the earth. Why do we? Because Paul's point is that they're the boss of you on earth. But you have a greater boss. You have a higher authority. And so you are to obey your employee, employer. You are to obey your teacher, your authority while on earth as long as it doesn't compromise God's word. That's the point he's making. Don't compromise your character, your values, God's word 
because you need to obey. That you, you have permission not to obey if that happens. And he goes on, and I think this is really key. He says, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. You ever meet those people who only work hard to be seen? Who only work hard to be noticed is some of you. You work hard so the boss will give you a pat on the back or give you a raise. You work hard to be seen by others, to, pe- to please the boss, to please the teacher. You got those students in your class that are always trying. To, it seems like they're the teacher's pet and they're trying to be that way. Paul says, stop it. Stop working to please people. Some of us serve and work really hard because we're trying to get ahead. We're trying to get noticed. Paul says, no, do it with a sincerity, a singleness of heart, a purity of heart. Why do we do this? Why should we work this way? Why should we obey our authority, Chris? I don't agree. Why should I obey? Fearing the Lord. You know why people try to get ahead? You know why you work so hard? You're anxious all the time. You're stressed out about work. Do you know why? Ultimately. It's because you're trying To do what only God can do. Here's what I mean. You don't fear the Lord because if you did, you wouldn't have to cut people in line. You wouldn't have to fudge numbers. You wouldn't have to try to get noticed and please everyone just to try and get ahead. Just to try and make more money. Because if you trusted the Lord, if you feared the Lord then you would trust that he would provide, that he would get you to where he wants you to be. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Christians who compromise their character to try and get ahead. If you don't don't fully trust the Lord, your purpose for work is to try and get the boss to notice you. You want that promotion. You want more money. You want that job. And Paul says, that's not why you work. And this is the reason that so many people are anxious right now and stressed out is because you're working for people. You're trying to please people or you're trying to earn it on your own. It's a lack of faith. And Paul says, why do you do this? In fact, in verse 23, he says, whatever you do, this is a good one, parents, for your kids. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. That word heartily, it means hardworking. It means not being lazy. And we got a generation right now that is lazy. And it came from lazy generations before. I'm just telling you. We're lazy. Why do we work hard? Why, why in the world, Chris, why should I work hard? I'm in a job I hate. We work hard because work, if you get this, if, 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 you, if you can get this, it will, it will change the way you live. Work was given as a way to worship. Christians have a problem because they believe worship is singing. I mean, seriously, you talk about worship. What are you talking about? Sunday mornings, lifting my hands, hearing the songs. That's my worship in my car. I'm worshiping. What a weak way to worship. It's a great way. Don't hear me. You see me praising. It's a great way to worship. But it's such a weak way to only think that is worship. I'm about to open your eyes. You ready? God's going to do this. Genesis 128. Don't put it up there. I don't even think you have it. Genesis 128. Do you know the first commission given by God? The first commission. Look it up. Genesis 128. The first commission to humans was to fill and subdue the earth. Do you know what that means? Listen, listen. This is what God has. You know, we got the great commission. Go and tell the world, make disciples of all nations, right? But your first commission, our first commission was to fill and subdue the earth. Here's what that means. You ready? 
if God expects us to do that, then that means to make the earth more useful for human benefit and enjoyment. The next chapter, God tells Adam and Eve to what? To work. To prepare and develop the earth. What does that mean? Study it. It means to make the earth more useful for people. To multiply. So check this now. This is why we work. Did God say work to pay bills? Work for your enjoyment? Work because it makes you happy? Work because that's what you're called to do? Work because you have to? No. Work is a way to worship. Work is a gift. And we are to use the talents and the gifts and the positions and the platforms we have for other people's good. I thank God for baristas. Come on, come on. You think I'm silly. But they take a coffee bean and they make it into something beautiful that I drink. And it is glory and I enjoy it. Don't you think... I'm just saying, this is what happens. So I, when I walk in and I smell coffee, no lie, thank you, God. I know you think that's silly, but I'm actually praising God for that smell, that taste. I enjoy that. Contractors, you take wood, you take raw material, and you make things that people live in, that people work in. Pray, I, pr I praise God for you. You're doing that for my enjoyment. Lawyers, you, you, you know, you work with laws and you work with, with justice and mercy and, and rules and regulations to formulate laws. And that's important. Fast food workers. If you, you just flip burgers, you think I'm not important. Ask everybody who goes to fast food joints. They appreciate you. They don't tell you. We don't tell you that. But like this is the importance of work. It's not for your benefit. The way you work. Don't miss this. The way you work. Will show people the God you serve. If you work to get ahead. If you work to people please. If you work to make more money. If you work to be secure. That is showing everyone. Who you serve. You don't believe me? Exodus 31. Bezalel and Aholiab. Two people you probably never heard of. Listen to what the Lord says about them. I have filled them with the spirit of God. I have filled him with the spirit of God. With ability and intelligence. With knowledge and all craftsmanship. To devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze. In cutting stones for setting. And in carving wood to work in every craft. He was, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What was the evidence? They were craftsmen, and they did it well. And people knew that. So don't you think your job is not important? Your work doesn't matter. Your work is a way to worship. And others will see God through your work. Students. Listen to me, if you're in school, if you're in college, the way you work in school shows your classmates and your teacher who God is. And you're like, great, I got to make all A's. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is the way you prepare, the way you study and not stress, and the effort you put into in your assignments and being a student will glorify God. I mean, don't think it doesn't matter. Everything we do matters. Now, some of you, this is real easy, right? Because you love your job. You love your work. You love the people you work with. Like, it's easy. It's easy to come to work happy. Like, there's little tiffs, but like, you love your job. That's 20% of you, by the way. 
Studies show us that 20% of us love our job. We're satisfied. You know what the 80% are? We hate our job. We hate, I'm saying we, I don't hate my job. You hate your job. You hate your job. You hate your boss. You hate your coworkers. You hate the stupid tasks that you have to do. You think it's pointless what you do. You don't want to. You don't want to mop floors. You don't want to file reports. You're stuck in an office. You've been here, and you're like, I feel unfulfilled. I don't even. I'm not even doing anything that's important. Some of you are stay-at-home moms or dads, and you feel guilty. Like, and, and you don't think your work matters. And you struggle because you think your job is not what your calling is supposed to be in life. Listen to me. Hear me very clear. Your job may not be your calling. Look at the Apostle Paul. You know what he did for a job? He was a tent maker. That was his job. That's the way he earned a living. But his calling was to make sure That the gospel is spread to Gentiles so that you and you and you and me can be saved. That was his calling, but the the way he made tents was a platform. Well, it's easy for you, Chris. You're a pastor. Of course you're doing God's work and God's calling. Let me just tell you, first off, there are some days that it's very hard to pastor. Because there are people. Like you and like me. And even though I'm in my calling and my job is a part of my calling. If I focus on you too long, I will be out. I will quit my job. But but God shows us that there's something about perseverance. You know, the problem with people today, the generation today that are going out and getting jobs, they stay one year. They say six months. They say two years. They say three years. And you know what happens? I'm unsatisfied. I don't like what I do. I don't like the people I work with. I don't think this is what I want to do with my life. Let me go try something else, right? And there's no perseverance. There's no endurance. I thank God for the trials. I thank God for you who are difficult. Because it's teaching me endurance. It's testing me. It's growing me. I need trials in my life. I need days where I don't want to pastor anymore. Am I supposed to just quit? All I have is a secular job. This is going to be eye-opening. You ready? Think about your job, your work, your school, whatever you do right now. If you are a follower of Jesus, listen, then you believe that Christ is the son of the living God. And when you put your faith, hope and trust in him immediately, immediately, the Holy Spirit began indwelling in your life, inside of you. Watch this. So the only thing that you need to do to turn your secular job into sacred is to walk through the door. Don't don't miss that. If you carry God with you every day, if you're a follower, just show hands. How many of you would say, I am saved, I'm a born again child of God? Just raise your hand if that's you. Okay. If it's not, don't raise your hand. It's okay. Just leave them up. Leave them up. Leave them up. Leave them up. Okay. If that's you. Now, okay, you can put them down. If that's you, If that's you, then you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Shake your head yes if you believe that. Okay, so that means wherever you go, there goes God. You understand that? So when you come to your job with a bad attitude, you are representing a God that you don't serve. You don't have a God with a bad attitude. I get it. Life happens. Circumstances happen. But you've got to get your strength from the Lord, your joy from the Lord, and not those circumstances. There is no secular job with a Christian. Don't think you got to work in church for ministry. As soon as you walk in, that secular becomes sacred. And Paul says, work hard. Work hard. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord, you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no 
impartiality. In other words, you have a boss that is higher than your boss, than your employer. You work for a greater reward than your salary. Money should not be your motive to work. And if you think, well, that's why I work. I got to pay bills. Okay, this is for you. This whole message is for you. We don't work to pay bills. We work to glorify God. Like that's the whole purpose. We worship. So whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we mop a floor, whether we are uh, flipping hamburgers, whether we are a nurse or, or stay-at-home mom, or whether we're a student, we work hard because we know that our hard work matters. Your work matters. What you do matters right now because people matter. And your work has an eternal value. And I know you're going to have some pushback. It's because some of you are in jobs that you hate and you think it doesn't matter. Every job that you as a Christian are in has eternal value. You say, well, wait, 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 wait. I don't, I don't agree. I'm not doing anything of eternal value. I'll push on you just a little bit. Psalm 37, 23. Write that down. Psalm 37, 23. Your work brings God pleasure. Did you know this? Listen to what the verse says. God delights in every detail in the lives of the godly. God delights in the every detail, every single detail, every single one. Everything you do at work, every conversation you have, every thought, everything you create with your hands, every time you shovel whatever you shovel, like it matters to God. And, and your work is a means for eternal reward. I know you don't want to think that way. and you don't, Some of us don't like that. But the scriptures tell us to what? Store up treasures in heaven. This is how we do that. What does it look like then at work or in school? Like what does it look like every day around the people, Chris? Because I can't go out and pass tracks. I can't, my, my job won't let me pray with people. Like how do I do this? Let me tell you some ways. Show up on time. Early. Have a great attitude. In the not so great moments. Stop responding to everything. Treat the people who don't deserve love. With more love and grace than you ever could. Oh. I don't know. Yeah I know you don't know. That comes from the Holy Spirit doing it. And they're going to be like why. And as soon as they ask why. You're in. You're in. You can tell them why. You can tell them about the grace and the love and the mercy that Jesus Christ has on you every single day. If you own a business or you manage people, listen very carefully. This means that you think more about people than a profit. And what is what I'm doing going to be a benefit for people? Or is it just going to put money in my pocket? Oftentimes, it means giving way more away with your business than it does taking in. I, I, Chris, I, I, okay. Because Jesus did this. You realize Jesus became poor. He gave up his kingdom, heaven. He left his he heaven. He came to this earth and became poor. And he, all he did was love people. And he had the greatest impact. And when you, don't miss this, when you experience the gospel, you become like it. Those who experience the gospel will always become like it. Marked by love, compassion, generosity. And I think one of the key things to remember while we work is Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus called to them to him and said, he was talking to the disciples, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. So you got these leaders, you got these bosses, you got authority who are just like 
demanding things and telling them what to do and, and, and you know, I don't want to take out the trash, so you do this. And I, I, I don't want to mop the floors, and you do this. And so they're, they're, they're giving them all the dirty work, and they're making them feel guilty about it. Jesus says this, it shall not be so among you, church. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Bond servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The greatest workers and the greatest leaders are the greatest servants. Go to work and serve. You know what happens when you start working and viewing work as a way to worship, thanking God for your job, even if it's not one you like? You know what happens? The people around you start wondering why. And then when you go to lunch with them, you, pr- you say, can I pray for our meal? Some of you have never done that. You go to lunch with people every day that are lost, and you have an opportunity to pray with them. So tomorrow... It's a good step. Don't be scared. Don't deny. Don't deny your faith. Just say, hey, I'm going to pray for my food. Can I pray for yours too? Watch what happens. Just watch what happens. Go into that boss that irritates you and just bless him. Just bless him. You struggle with being on time tomorrow? Come in 15 minutes early. I can do it on repeat. Not for them, but for the Lord. Work hard. For the Lord. And when they ask you why, you tell them your story about you and Jesus. Your workplace is the biggest mission field you have. Your school students is the biggest mission field that you have right now. Do you look like God? You're either, listen, this is the truth. You're either pulling people closer to Jesus Or you're pushing them away by the way that you work, by the way that you study or prepare for school, by the way you act, by the things you say, by the way you respond. This is how we disciple. This is how we disciple. This is how we live on mission in our workplace. But let me say one word of caution. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Worship God, not your work. You can be a hard worker and you can work hard, but working hard is a gift until it becomes a God. And some of you think and have visions and aspirations and all you do is think about work, work, work. And you spend more time at work and you've got a good reason. You want to, you want to provide. You want to be secure. You're pleasing you or you're pleasing others and you're not trusting the Lord. Work hard for the Lord. Not to get more. to have, That's selfish. You've got to lay your work down as a way to worship. You know, before the fall, before Adam and Eve sinned, work was the gift like we talked about. But since then, did you know? You know why you hate work so much? Like it's, you don't want to work. You want to be lazy. You know why? Because when the fall happened, when sin entered the world, God cursed the ground. God cursed work and said it would be hard. It would be toilsome. It'd be thorns. It'd be stress. Like, it's because of sin. And what used to be a pleasure and a gift for God and a way to worship has become, well, work's become an idol and an identity. When you meet someone, you say, hey, you know, I'm Chris. What do you do? What do you do? You're already, and you don't, we don't mean it, but we're already identifying them with what they do and not who they are. I think the church has messed this up in a lot of ways. The church is always trying to find people who can help them. And so they identify, hey, well, he's got this or she's got this. Don't let work become your God. I know some spouses are in here are thinking that their husbands or their wives are like that. Look, don't push them in that. But pray about that. Talk about this today, this week. Like, is, is worship an idol? I mean, is work an idol? 
We should work to worship. Don't worship your work. How do we... How do we do this? How do we protect our hearts and our minds so that work doesn't become a God? Three things and I'm through. You ready? Number one, give God your work every day. Students, give God your school, your classes, your teachers, your classmates every day. What does that look like? Pray. God, I'm going to work and I'm going to have to see Phelan. And Lord, Comes in, and it's just hard. And I don't know how, I just, God, I just need help. Help me love him today. Help me not have any attitude when I walk in or when he walks in. Let me be joyful around him. Let him see God through me. Lord, give me, give me power and strength and wisdom through your spirit that I can impart on Phelan. That was an example. That doesn't happen. But, but I'm just saying, like, do you pray for your work? God, I'm going to be in, like, we got nurses in here. Like, I'm going to see a lot today, God. I need you to fill me with your spirit so I look and I think and I say and I respond and I post just like you. Give me the words to talk with patients so they know that that's not just me talking, that's you speaking. And God, give me the opportunity to see a need and meet it. To see a hurt and heal it. God, give me a moment to share my story with someone today. Let me focus on you while I'm making a house. While I'm staying with my kids. Whatever I'm doing. While I'm in math class, God. You hadn't, it seems like you haven't given me a math brain. You know I'm struggling in that class. No matter what. God, I need your supernatural wisdom. And when I go in there, you know the teacher's always on me, God. Help me push through that and see her as you see her, God. Because even at my best, I'm not good enough for you. But you gave me grace. And you gave me mercy. And you show me love and compassion. God, I'm walking in sin. But you are still there. You are still reaching out. You are still driving drawing me close. So when I go into that classroom, I pray I do the same thing to that teacher. Like I'm just saying, do you pray this way every day? That's a long time. Is it? Is it? Don't you want to stop being miserable in your job? Then give it to God. Worship him. That's the first one. Number two. No elbows. Leave work at work. Don't take it home. Now, I, I can hear my wife because she's a teacher and she brings assignments home, right? So that makes sense. What I'm saying is, when you come home, home is different than work. You've got a family or you've got a different environment and you need a break from work. Other, otherwise, work becomes your God. Take a break. I don't know if I get it all done. I got to get this. I got to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to the verses. You're not fearing the Lord. You're not trusting him. Well, I'm behind. I didn't plan. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you worked heartily unto the Lord, you would have done those things. So catch up and don't get there again. Like, can you imagine if we worked this way? We wouldn't be stressed out. Students, some of you are so stressed out about classes. It's the reason is. You just got to work as hard as you can and do your best. Give it to God. Pray it up and see what happens. Trust the Lord. Same thing with the job. Number three. Probably a, a very important one. Rest as hard as you work. We don't like that, do we? Because we feel unproductive. But what if the only way to be the most productive you is to get filled up during rest. You can't pour out if you're not being poured into. You need time to just sit and do nothing. You need time with God, with God's people. You need to rest. Often God will rest you if you don't rest yourself. I'm not, I don't say that to scare I'm just telling you, how many people have heart attacks because they're so stressed out and they're working so much and they end up in the hospital because they're, they haven't taken time to rest. Like, you, 
if you're doing a project with a company or you, you've got something going on, you've got deadlines to meet and you've got, you're in a meeting and you're talking to everyone and everybody's stressed out, what would happen if you go, guys, girls, just listen. We're not getting anywhere. I know we got a deadline by tomorrow, but let's just, uh, let's just stop. Let's go home or come back in an hour or two. Let's just rest for a minute. Let's get like people would go, what? No, we got to we got to answer this. We got to solve this. Like, how could we rest? As soon as they ask you a question, you're in. The gospel can come out, and the gospel can come out anytime. Don't misinterpret me. But like, if they ask you how can we rest, say, I'm glad you asked that. Let me tell you what I learned this Sunday. Let me tell you about working. That when we feel this anxiety and stress and pressure and, and you know why? It's because we're not trusting in God. Who's God? Oh, let me, this is a great conversation. You want to go to lunch? You want, you want to go to dinner? Like, like I'm just saying, discipleship, leading people closer to Christ is not as hard as we make it out to be. How you doing with using your work as worship? It's convicting to me. Even in the church, it's convicting to me. Because sometimes I get more focused on processes and products than people. And we're supposed to fill and subdue the earth. That means what I'm doing right now and what I do during the week when I have to go to the hospital three times a day. There's nothing in me. You can call me a bad pastor or what. There's nothing in my flesh that wants to go to the hospital three times in one day. Nothing. But I got to lay down that flesh. And I got to say these people are who you called me to fill and subdue the earth with. So I got to go and I need to take time for people. Do that with your job, with your school, with your kids at home. This is what it means to live on mission. Start viewing your work as a great mission field and a way to worship God.